left off last week, we spoke about the tabernacle in the wilderness, and we talked about how the presence of God was on the tabernacle. We told, said that everybody, all the two million uh, Israelites they were in the wilderness every day. They saw the cloud and the fire by night, and they knew that God was with them. We go through stuff. We don't have a cloud by day or a fire by night. But we have an inner witness. And we have the truth of God's word that says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. If you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you go through the fire, I will go through them with you. And so I, I trust that you have been allowing that word to flow over you this week. Keep reminding yourself that God is near, that God wants to manifest himself to us every single day. Today, as we talk about the journey into the presence of God, I want us to focus now on the contents of the Ark of the Covenant. You know, it wasn't just an empty box. We're going to read the scriptures that describe what was uh, what the Ark of the Covenant was. The Ark of the Covenant was in the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies was in the place where God dwelt on earth in the midst of his people. It was actually a physical place and, and there was a, a box that God told Moses to build. And, and that box had a mercy seat on it. And a seat is where somebody sits. And so we see that God sat on the, on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant and manifested himself. I hope I get to it today, but I want us to understand that when we belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to us, everybody say belong. So much of, of our relationship with God is belonging to him and him belonging to us. I hope that we can bring, bring out the fact that God wants to dwell in our midst and wants us to base our relationship on him, with him, on the fact that we belong. I've been invited into the family of God through Jesus Christ. And, and so you and I are together. We are brothers and sisters in the family of God because of his grace and because of his love. But I want to look at the contents of the box. It's not based on fluff. It's based on something real. The contents of the box. The box was beautiful. I mean, it was all covered with gold. All you saw was gold. Pure gold. It all glittered with gold. There was a big ch uh, cherubim of gold that was that was manufactured and placed over the Ark of the Covenant. Um, I want you to see a, a picture of that. I was going to sing a little ditty while you were watching that, but I thought it would distract from what you saw. So there were three things in, in the Ark of the Covenant. There was the, um, 
a, a jar of the manna. There was a, the rod, Aaron's rod that budded, and there were the Ten Commandments, the, the tablets of stone that that um, Moses brought down from Mount Sinai, written by the finger of God, actually etched into the the stone was the commandment that God gave to Moses and based on that commandment there was the there was the um, the law of God w w w was there when you have a birthday or when you on Christmas morning uh, people give you gifts it's all wrapped up with nice wrapping bows and all sorts of things. And for a while, you just look at the wrappings and you say, wow, that's a beautiful gift. But that's not all you want. You don't really just want the wrapping. You're actually interested in what's in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the gift. And so as we look at the box, as we look at, at the gift that God gave to the children of Israel, in the tabernacle, want to look inside it, want to see what is significant, and so we realize that the main thing was the, the Ten Commandments, and that's what I want to focus on today. Next week we'll get into to the other things that are in the Ark of the Covenant. But the tablets of stone that God actually etched into, the Bible says, with the finger of God, he etched into the stone Ten Commandments. Um, I hope you got the notes. If you didn't get the notes for this message today, they're by the door in the rack, so make sure you get it. In Exodus chapter 25, Exodus 25, beginning verse 10, look, look at it. Have the people make an ark of acacia wood, a sacred chest, 45 inches long, 27 inches wide, and 27 inches high. Overlay it inside and outside with pure gold and run a molding of gold all around it. Cast four gold rings and attach them to its four feet, two rings on each side. Make poles from acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings at the sides of the ark uh, to carry it. These carrying poles must stay inside the rings, never uh, remove them. Verse 16. When the ark is finished, place inside it the stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant, which I will give you. And then make the ark's cover, the place of atonement, from pure gold, it must be 45 inches long, 27 wide. And then make two cherubim from hammered gold and place them on the two ends of the atonement cover. <clears throat> Mold the cherubim on each end of the atonement cover. Make it all from one piece of gold. The cherubim will face each other and look down on the atonement cover. With their wings spread above, they will protect it. Place inside the ark the stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant, which I will give you. Then put the atonement cover on top of the ark. I will meet with you there. The Lord said, I will meet with you there. The Lord said, in the Holy of Holies, at the place of the Ark of the Covenant, with all these descriptions, God said, I will meet you there. I will meet you there and I will talk to you from above the atonement cover or the mercy seat between the gold cherubim that hover over the Ark of the Covenant. From there, I will give you my commands for the people of Israel. Israel. It's an awesome picture 
of man meeting God and God disclosing himself to man. Once a year, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies where this Ark of the Covenant was. Once a year, the high priest would come in with a basin of blood from the animal that was sacrificed at the brazen altar. He would bring that basin of blood in, into the Holy of Holies and he would sprinkle the blood on top of the cover, the mercy sheet, between the cherubim. He would take the blood and he would sprinkle it on the, on the cover. Verse 16 of our text says that this 45 by 27 box contained the tablets of stone which Moses brought down from Mount Sinai. The Ten Commandments, which represent the law of God given to govern the people of Israel. Now we're talking about our journey into the presence of God. We're talking about worship. We're talking about learning how to be intimate with God and express our praise and our thanksgiving to him. But we find that that place where God said, I will meet with you, in that box, there was the Ten Commandments and they were the demands of God. The Ten Commandments were demands that God made on the children of Israel as to how they were to worship it described how they were to live and it described how they were to interact with each other. There were not 10 suggestions. Some people think that they were just 10 ideas that God had about that might make, make life better for us. They're called the 10 commandments because they are the 10 demands demands that God made on the, the children of Israel. And the Ten Commandments represent the whole law. If you want to read the whole law, read the book of Leviticus, and you find the law of God that God gave to Moses that would govern the way they lived, would govern the way they worshiped, and would get, govern the way that they um, interacted with each other. And so, they couldn't put the whole law, and so they put the Ten Commandments in the Ark of the Covenant to represent the law of God, to represent the demands that God would make on them. Now, the significance of, of this is that the presence of God cannot be separated from the commands of God. I'm going to say that again. The presence of God cannot be separated from the commands of God. We think that we can go in, come in any way we want and worship God and have fellowship with him and forget the commands, forget the demands that God makes on us as followers of his. God said to the children of Israel, I will be your God and you will be my people. In other words, I'm going to pour my blessing upon you and you're going to obey the demands that I make on you. And so uh, in, in Deuteronomy 28, it talks about all the curses that would come upon the people if they did not obey the commands. God had a very harsh view of sin. He had a very harsh view of sin. And somehow we think that maybe God doesn't have as harsh a view of sin now as he did then. But I want us to know that we can't be in the presence of God and forget the commands of God and be, and, and be living any way we want. I can't live any way I want and be in fellowship with God. The psalmist said, who can ascend into the mountain of the Lord? Who can come up and worship? He said, those who have clean hands and a pure heart. 
those who are doing the right thing and have the right attitude in their heart. And so, um, because God is holy, and holy still means without sin. If you're purely holy, then there's no sin whatsoever. God who is holy, holy, nobody who is holier than God, is totally devoid of sin. There's no shadow of sin in him at all. In fact, God hates sin to the same degree that he loves sinners. Now, you say, how can that happen? God hates sin to the same degree that he loves sinners. We get confused about that. And I hope that what we share today may help to um, shed some light on it. Sometimes we get so lost in, in God's, the message of God's love that we forget his holiness and we forget the fact that he hates sin. Let's look at some of these verses here in the psalm. Psalm 97, 10. Hate evil, you who love the Lord, who preserve the souls of his godly ones. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverted mouth I hate. Proverbs 6, 16 says, there are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plants, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and the one who spreads strife among brothers. Look at the list that I put together for that. The things that the Lord hates, the things that are an abomination to him, pride, lying, murder, a heart that plots evil, pursuing wrong objectives, speaking lies about other people, and spreading strife and discord. That may not be your top 10 list of sins, But these are the things that that um, that Proverb, the book, the writer of Proverbs said that the Lord hates. And the question I have is: Do we hate what God hates? Lying is one of them. Well, we're okay with lying as long as it's a white lie. So we color our wives. We call them, we call some of them black. We call some of them white. But God doesn't color lies. He just said it's one of the things I hate. So God wants us to be truthful. And yet, we are so used to living in a world where people don't tell the truth. We are so used to living in a world where people shade the truth and don't tell the truth that we get caught up in it. And so we use the world as a standard. And so when it's convenient for us, when it gets us out of a jam, then we won't have any trouble lying. But if we understand that lying is one of the things that God hates, and then we can go through all the others as well, we don't have any trouble with murder. We, uh, we're so glad that murder is there, because that would be on our top ten list also, wouldn't it? So murder is there, but um, spreading strife and discord is there also. 
And I'm not sure that we would put that on our list because sometimes by the things that we say, by the way we act, we spread discord, we spread strife between other people. We're actually doing something that God hates. God wants to convict us of sin, wants us to align ourselves up with his word and live the way he has called us to live. In reading the New Testament, especially the writings of the Apostle Paul, it sometimes looks like the Old Testament law was a mistake, that God wrote the law, and then when Jesus came on the scene, he kind of hit himself on the head and said, oh man, I made a mistake writing the law. And so he is quick in heaven and, 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 and throws grace down and so ever since uh, Christ died for our sins, we are living under this dispensation of grace, and grace wipes out the law. Now I have favor from God whether I sin or not, because grace is undeserved favor. And so there are many people that say, well, if I... It, it, if I live by God's grace, I don't have to worry about sin. And we get ourselves all messed up, and we think, we will wonder why we're not living under the blessing of God, because we're not being obedient to his word. I'm here to tell you today that God did not make a mistake when he wrote the law, and God is not has not changed his mind about the law. I'm, I'm, I'm going to explain that. Um, the New Testament truth is not that God has become soft on sin. God has not become soft on sin. He has not changed his mind at all about sin. Look at that verse in, in Matthew chapter 5. You have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder. Now, that's the New Living Translation. In the um, author and the King James Version, it talks about, it's talking about the law of God. You have, you've heard that the Old Testament law said thou shalt not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. That was the law. That uh, also a part of the Ten Commandments. But look at verse 22. But I say to you, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you're in danger of the fires of hell. And so Jesus is teaching there in the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5. He says, now the law says you shall not murder. But I'm saying to you, if you have hatred in your heart, if you hate your brother, you've already committed murder in your heart. You're already guilty of murder. Everybody go, hmm. Now, look at the next for, for scripture. Chapter 5. You have heard the commandment says, you must not commit adultery. That was a part of the law. Don't commit adultery. But I say, Jesus said, but I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Does that sound like God is getting soft on sin? I don't think so. God is making, uh, Jesus was making uh, things tougher. Jesus was making things more difficult. And if you read chapter 5 and that portion where Jesus refers to the Old Testament law and what he said, 
go back and read that, that chapter and you'll see that every time that Jesus refers to what was written in the law, he says, but I say unto you, and he has something more stringent. And, and I bring that out just to let us know that God has not become soft on sin. I want, uh, let, let's turn to four, First John chapter 1. Begin with verse 4 there. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is himself is, is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us. Everybody say cleanses us. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Somehow we get the, the, the thought that if I'm going to be a Christian, I have to toe the line. I have to be perfect and live a perfect life. I'm here to tell you this morning, there was only one person that lived a perfect life, and that was Jesus Christ. He did that for you. The law was written with the understanding that was impossible to fall. And Jesus made it more impossible to fall. So my goal is not to live a sinless life. Because it's impossible for me to do that. I'm living in a cesspool. Come on, somebody. We're living in a cesspool, a cesspool of sin. And the, the cesspool that we live in has an effect on us. Now, yes, I create the kingdom of God in my life when I invite Christ into my life. And so around me, the kingdom of God is established in me, but I'm still living in a cesspool. I'm bringing the light of God. I'm bringing the life of God. I'm bringing the love of God into the cesspool. Well, let's not forget how evil this world is. And it's not just evil now. It has been evil. But the evil is becoming more evil. And you see that as you read the newspaper or watch the news or or go to work or, and, and, and live in this world. We are, are realize that more and more evil things are happening. Evil people are becoming more evil. Sin is becoming more sinful. And we're living in this world, but we're not of this world. And I can tell by the time now that I'm not going to have a chance to... to I'll do this, I'll, I'll try to um, finish up, but I don't, I don't want to leave you in this place where, where you don't feel as though there's any hope. I want you to realize that <clears throat> on top of the ark with the law in it was a covering that we call the mercy seat. Everybody say, mercy seat. 
Mercy covers the demands of the law. In the New Testament, we see the word grace, grace and mercy, God's divine favor. Not that God winks at sin today, but I want to understand that God poured out the full wrath, fullness of his wrath upon his son Jesus when Jesus took your sin and my sin and laid it upon himself. That's why when we read about the cross of Calvary and, and what Jesus went through in the Garden of Gethsemane at the, at the whipping post where he was scourged and on the cross, where he was taking on your sin and my sin, he was taking on the sins of the whole world. The hatred that God had for sin was poured out upon Jesus, his only begotten son. Jesus, that's why when Jesus cried out from the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was being forsaken because he was taking on the sins of the world. He was being forsaken by the Father because of your sin and my sin that were being laid upon him. And so Jesus suffered for your sin and for my sin. So nobody can say that God has become soft on sin because his full wrath was, was poured out upon Jesus on the cross. When Jesus did that, he provided for you eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him. Now believe does not mean I just believe that Jesus was. Believe on him means that I, I, I fall after him. I accept him. I belong to him and he belongs to me. And so um, there is this um, reality that Christ is in me and I am in Christ. I am learning how. Everybody say learning. I'm growing. I'm, I'm learning how to be like Christ. Not only does grace, and, and, and I'll talk more about this uh, next week, not only does grace save us from our, our sins, but grace also provides the power not to sin. It's in your notes. I think it's in your notes. Grace saves you, but grace also breaks the power of sin over you. Um, let's look at, it's in your notes there, um, Romans 8. It says, so now there is no condemnation to those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. And so the question this morning is, do you belong to God through Christ does he belong to you? That word belong is in verse 1 and verse 2. For those who belong, for those who believe, and because you belong, or in because you believe, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you. Verse 3 says, the law of Moses was unable to save us, because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his only son in a body like the bodies, like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declares an end to sin's control over us by his son as a sacrifice 
for Hashem. So even though the law is there in the, in the Ark of the Covenant, even though God has not gone soft on sin, you are not going to be judged for your sin because you you have the blood of Jesus on you because you belong to Christ because you are a card carrying member of the of the family of God God is your father Jesus is your brother because you have accepted Christ and you belong to him you may still and you will still sin. But now I sin as a member of the family of God. God is not going to judge that sin and keep me from heaven. Why? Because I belong. And that's the message of Christianity. Do you want to be belong to Christ? Do you believe? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Not follow all these laws and rules and you'll be saved. Believe and be saved. Follow him and be saved. Become a part of him. Become a part of his family. And so the one thing that I cling, cling to is my repentance. And because of Christ has died for me, I'm, I live a forgiven life. I'm always coming to God, and I'm, out, I'm always saying, Lord, I repent. I humble myself in your presence. I humble myself. I know that I'm a part of your family because of God's grace. I receive your grace for today, to live a holy life. I, I receive your grace today so that I can live a holy life. I receive your favor today so that I can be an overcomer. I receive your, your favor today Because I am your child, not to, not to become your child. I'm already a child of God, already belong. Once you belong, you belong. I'm not saying you can't walk out, you can, but it takes a process. But, but, but I'm, by God's grace, I'm saved. And then by applying that grace every day, I become an overcomer, and I am more and more like Christ because I'm growing. But if we think that we can live our old, our old life, if we think that we can live in sin and, and, and not be following God and still go to heaven, we're going to be in trouble. You understand what I'm saying? God, God loves you. There's no question about that. God has purchased you with his blood. You belong to him. He now wants you to apply that grace so that the power of sin is broken every day. And the longer you live, the more grace you have to live an overcoming life. The longer you live in the grace of God, in the favor of God, the longer you live with his grace being poured out in your life, the stronger you get. The less you sin, the stronger you get. And so we can identify more and the the and the, 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 the stronger I get the more precious is my worship. Coming into the presence of God now becomes a greater blessing to me because I'm receiving his grace, I'm receiving his favor, 
I'm receiving his love that's being poured out in my life. Let's pray. So, Father, here we are. So many of have accepted your plan of salvation. We belong to you. You belong to us. None of us are perfect. There's only one perfect one, and he lives in us. He dwells in us. Because of his favor, we are receiving strength and power day by day to live, live like him. Help us, O oh God, to learn how to apply your grace every day in our lives as a worshiper so that my worship becomes stronger. My worship yields more help in my life because you are making me pure. You are making me more holy like yourself. So I pray, Lord, that you will continue to work in our lives. And from glory to glory, keep changing us. From one glory to another glory, allowing your grace to work in our lives and to make us more like you.